Okay. Hello, good morning, everybody. Um, next up, we are going to talk about um, how in the world uh, we're supposed to get any uh, investments right now. Um, and my good friend Matthew Nordgren is going to lead this discussion. So take it away, Matthew. Hey, good morning. Good afternoon, depending on where you are. Thank you for being here with us today. We're going to talk about raising capital in this environment. Uh, we have a variety of esteemed panelists uh, here that will, will allow uh, them to introduce themselves. First, thank you, Susan, for putting this together. Uh, if you guys haven't been there yet, uh, Susan does wonderful events uh, on a boat, and, uh, none other uh, than in Long Beach, and it's just a beautiful event. Can't wait to do it with you again in person, Susan. Uh, but thank you for allowing us to have these conversations in a virtual environment. They're important, uh, more important now than ever if you're sitting there watching this and you're thinking about how companies are capitalizing themselves in this environment. Well, uh, in order to do that, um, I'm going to provide a little bit of background um, on Arcadian and, and our own investor thesis. Uh, but let's start with our panelists. Um, uh, we have Jordan, Kyle, and Gavin. Um, if, uh, if we can just go... Uh, go to each of you guys and talk a little bit about your perspective and your company, and uh, that'll help everybody know uh, where you're coming from uh, with your comments throughout today's panels. Jordan? I think you're on mute there, Jordan. Oh. Uh, nope, says not. Okay, you're good to go. <laughs> okay. Uh, sorry about that. Um, it was uh, said I was on. Anyway, um, I think, uh, thank you, Matt, and uh, appreciate you uh, including us in this, Susan. Uh, we're excited to talk a little bit about what's going on in the market. Um, so our firm is called Land Race Financial. Uh, we are a asset-based lender to the cannabis sector. We've done, we've been around for a couple of years now. We've done about 90, a little bit under $100 million of deals so far. Uh, across uh, 10 or 12 different investments. Actually, we also are investor in Matt's fund as well. Um, and so he's been a great, uh, great partner. So that's what we do. We focus on real estate, uh, machinery, equipment, and other hard assets. And uh, we have a number of investments in California and a couple around, around the rest of the country. Thank you, Jordan. Appreciate that. Yep. Hey, hey Kyle, see you're driving. Be safe. How you doing? <sighs> I think it's got you on mute as well, my friend. Mm. There we go. Oh, Kyle, Kyle, we'll come back to you. You're on mute there. Uh, Gavin, thanks for dialing in, buddy. How are you doing? I'm doing well, thanks. Uh, I see Kyle looks like, Kyle, can we hear you? Yep, I, uh, oh. I think I've unmuted myself. Okay, there we go, Kyle. Sorry, go ahead, bud. Great to see you. Matt, nice to see you. How are you doing? We're doing blessed. We're staying healthy uh, and we're excited to hear from you today. So drive safe, my friend. Awesome. Uh, tell us where you're coming from. Sure. Um, so a uh, quick shout out to Susan as well. You know, I, I speak at Canaccord conferences and, and uh, there's something special about Susan's where it just feels more homey, where you actually get to know people on a, on a more personal level. And I, I just, I enjoy her events. So um, great to all you guys for, for joining. So I'm the CEO of, of uh, what's now Glasshouse Group. We were four funds. We raised about $53 million in those funds. And uh, like everybody else then went into the capital crunch. And um, the difference between, for us was in trying to raise money was that we own our own assets, meaning we own you know, 500,000 square feet of greenhouse. We own retail, including the real estate. So when it was time for us to go out there and raise money, we had an advantage that we actually had hard assets where people felt like, as opposed to maybe a brand or something highly leveraged, that there was something of substance that it wouldn't go to zero if, if all things you know um, went, went to heck on you. Yeah. Um, the other thing is my business going into this was I've raised a lot of money for commercial real estate projects for many, many years. So I had a lot of investors, but uh, so I, I had an advantage and that's, we, we, we fully funded our $17.5 million last raise. Um, without that, 
uh, we might have had to lever up some of our assets, things like that, just because I would say for every dollar of need in cannabis, there was, you know, five cents out there. Um, so it's, it's been it's been difficult. The last comment I'll make is, um, you know, we we will be cash flow positive in the third quarter and very profitable, profitable in the fourth quarter. And that's that's what investors are looking for. Yeah, they are, Kyle. I, 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 if you uh, uh, read this uh, stat the other day, that 23% of companies that IPO'd last year on the big boards in the United States were cash flow positive businesses. It's the lowest, I think, in a long, long time. Um, investors are going to look for something a little different. They're going to want some. They're going to want some cash flow. They're going to want real demand. They're going to want real assets. And we've got a number of you guys here to talk to us a little bit about that today. Uh, and Kyle, your real estate background is going to be tremendously valuable here. We'll play some ping pong back and forth with Jordan and his structural brain and his debt and credit finance background. And uh, Gavin, you're coming in with a little bit of a legal background as well, but also a, uh, an operator of one of the more successful vertical businesses. Uh, thanks for joining us. Tell us a little bit about what you're up to and the perspective you're bringing into the dialogue today. Yeah, thanks, Matthew. Um, and again, I just, Susan, thanks for, for having me on this. Uh, the first one you had me on was the Emerald Cup several years ago, and it's, uh, that was a really fun panel, and I enjoy these um, because, uh, honestly, I'm an advocate first, and at heart, um, I love to persuade people, um, and I, I love to uh, using cannabis as a milieu to sort of change the culture. And that's really where I, I started from. And when I left the practice of law to get into cannabis, um, it was uh, at that time throwing my career on the bonfire. And I was happy to do it, uh, quite frankly. Um, it was quite risky, but um, made my Jewish father nervous as hell. You know, why would you do that? But uh, it's turned out, uh, it, you know, that, that it was a, a damn good bet. It's been a hell of a struggle, as you all know. Um, I like to call this easily the shittiest get rich quick scheme I've ever been involved in. But, um, <laughs> you know, uh, so, uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I came to this industry as a cannabis attorney, um, advocate early, Prop 215, um, Central California based. And uh, in 2015, I left the private practice of law to found a company called Endus Holding. Um, I left that company in early 2016, I guess, end of 2015, and founded Grupo Floor, my current company. Um, and Grupo Floor started as a land holding company, leasing large tract farms in the Salinas Valley, where we are allowed to cultivate uh, in the open for the first time. And um, that company just grew into a vertical, um, uh, vert vertically integrated organization. And... Um, I was, you know, I've been on the board since the start. I'm a founder, but I, I, I took over the role of CEO um, and chairman. Uh, well, I guess I've been chairman for a while, but I took over the role of CEO in October of 2019. And so where I'm coming from, which was where you started, Matthew, is um, like a lot of companies, but particularly the larger operators, um, you know, we incurred a tremendous amount of debt in trying to build out our company. A lot of, frankly, not so much out of avarice, but out of fear that we were going to get gobbled up by all the Canadian money coming into our little valley here in Salinas. Um, we we're just trying to augment all different parts of our business from uh, farms to manufacturing to uh, uh, you know, distribution and retail. And uh, we just got caught, we caught, caught short and um, it's just been a very tough struggle. And so I, my participation in raising capital has been more um, from restructure. Before I got into cannabis, I was a restructure attorney working with chapter 11s and turnarounds um, right. in, in restructuring enterprises. And so um, I think that's why the board chose me to jump on as CEO and sort of manage the company's redirection. And, um, and so, you know, frankly, I was kind of six feet beyond the end of my rope before COVID. <laughs> COVID really kind of came in and just made what was a disaster with the vape crisis, you know, capital market implosion. Uh, and then COVID, it was just like, this is, now it's ridiculous. So um, hats off to all the operators and everybody in this industry who has stayed tough. I will say advocates, and the people who started this industry, like the spirit of this industry, are super steel-spined, tough individuals. This is, this is a rough ride, and I don't think anybody, uh, the visitors are going to go away, but I think the people who are core are going to stick through this thing and, and see it through. Thank you, Gavin. Couldn't agree with you more. These entrepreneurs are constantly amazing us. They're battle-tested for a lot of the reasons you just mentioned, but 
Uh, you feel like the last five years, it's just one thing or another, but the good news is uh, that creates opportunity and adversity creates great opportunity for leaders too within that and businesses and people. Uh, and I think we're starting to see some of that right now, as you mentioned, Gavin. Um, uh, let's set the stage a little bit, friends. Um, this is kind of fun. Now you got a little bit of everyone's background. You see, so Jordan's got a great finance mind to structure these deals. We're going to use him and his, uh, his day-to-day -day, uh, thinking in terms of how, how to shape some of this for you. Uh, Kyle's got a tremendous real estate background, real asset background. Uh, uh, Gavin's got great legal and, and, and advocacy background. Meanwhile, all three know as much about vertically integrated businesses in this industry as anybody you'll come across. So this will be fun. Uh, my name is Matt Nordgren at Arcadian Fund, uh, a managing partner, founder. We're a private equity fund, venture capital fund, but essentially a growth equity fund. We're lucky to be working with Jordan Allen and his team. We partner up a lot. We focus on equity. We're going to talk to you from an equity perspective. Uh, so you're going to get really unique perspectives here, four different folks. Let's set the stage for everybody watching. Uh, Jordan, take it first, and let's just kind of pass the ball around here. Talk about the landscape going into the pandemic. Uh, mind you, the industry did grow to 36% compound annual growth rate last year. Really nice. Uh, as Gavin mentioned, there's some asset value <coughs> happening. But uh, above some of the obvious things, tell us, set the stage a little bit going into the pandemic and what you've experienced here in the beginning part so that we can really then jump into what are we all going to do about it, if you guys don't mind sharing that. Yeah. Um, make sure everybody can hear me. I'm not in mute this time. Yes. <laughs> okay, great. Hi, hi, Gavin. Long time no see. How you doing, man? Um, hey, uh, you know, it's interesting, Matt. I, I think one of the things that I often say to people when they ask me, how's the, how's the industry doing? Is I say, because of the unique nature that it's federally legal and state um, legal, um, it's really not, in my opinion, like one industry from a national perspective. You have to really think about it by state by state. This is effectively like 33 different business industries. And I think in a state like California, where most of the people are today, I think you have different, you probably have three or four different sub -market. Oh, we lost you, Jordan. Okay, we're going to keep the hot potato going until we get Jordan back. Kyle, how about you? Driving up the road, tell us about the state of affairs today and where we are in the markets. So um, I, I touched a little bit on it. Actually, uh, it looks like Jordan's back. Should we let him finish? <laughs> oh, did we I, lost I, you I, don't, a little bit. I don't know what happened. I'm <laughs> okay. sorry. I, I, didn't, I didn't touch my screen. I, my, I don't know what happened. I apologize. I'll yeah. try to pay attention to see if I'm for some reason going to mute. Anyway, um, I, where did you lose me? I was kind of, I was saying that it's really 33 different sectors and California yeah. is kind of three or four different subsectors. So when sense. we look at an investment, we actually kind of dig into that level. We look at the state, obviously, and the particular region where the company's at and where do they focus on. Now you have MSOs, but, but even MSOs aren't all the same. And so you need to kind of dig in and look at the MSOs and where are they located? Um, what are the states that they're focused on? And, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty interesting. I mean, it, it, it makes for kind of an interesting um, analysis because you can't just, it's just not one size fits all when you're, when you're evaluating. You really need to look sector by sector. So I think a lot of that has been localized. You know, in a lot of the jurisdictions, um, people have been able to um, have a path towards profitability. That is the most key thing, um, being cash flow positive and having sufficient cash on hand. Um, you know, listen, everybody knows what happened to the Canadian Stock Exchange. Everybody, you know, a lot of the companies were forced to go up there. You know, Matt and I have talked about this a bunch. The problem is that oh, in the, 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 the <laughs> typical, the, the typical um, uh, pros, uh, typical sequence is what I was looking for, that companies normally go through um, in raising capital, it's friends and family, A, B, C, and then somewhere along the way, you're able to access institutional private capital, private debt, private equity, and that has been missing from this sector. And to a great extent, until that really gets fixed with the, you know, with the federal 
with a federal fix, I think the industry is going to continue to struggle. And so operators have to really focus in on just what I said, being cash flow positive, having plenty of, of cash on hand. And from our perspective, that's, you know, that's what we're looking for. Anyway, I'll, I'll take a pause there. Thank you, Jordan. That's great. So, so let's, um, let's you and I sort of come at this conversation from an investor's perspective and give our thoughts. Of course, uh, with the two gentlemen that are on the phone, the debt and credit stuff you're talking about is going to be more important right now. And quite frankly, it's more important to everybody because that's where we get first access to real institutional capital, right? So what you're doing is extremely important. Uh, Kyle, if you'll come into the conversation and Jordan laid out a couple of things from his perspective. Maybe from an operator's perspective and from somebody who understands real estate value and real asset value, uh, how did we get from where we were to where we are today and how are you feeling about it as we move forward? So, um, absolutely. So, um, Jordan, I, I mean, I want to piggyback on, on what he said, which was um, very interesting. I, I came into this at first as investor and then... Um, you know, figuring I would just, we would buy some assets in a, in a capital starved uh, market. And, um, and so, you know, we started in 2016, we started on the retail and the, and the cultivation level. And the thing that we did, money raising was easy at the time. If you had the courage and you had a good story um, and it was all about growth, growth, growth. And sometimes it's better to be lucky than good because we were going up to Canada and we were being asked to go public and it was, it was very frothy. And I just didn't, I didn't like, I, I didn't like what I saw. And so we, even though a lot of my investors felt that was a quick way to, um, you know, make a spin on their money. I basically, since I'm the largest investor in the company, I basically uh, pushed back and we got, um, you know, at the time, a lot of people were saying, let's go asset light, asset light, because of what happened up in Canada, which the asset heavy got rewarded, and then they got hammered. So we literally, when I say lucky than good, I just had this idea that let's go low debt, let's use our cash, let's not, and as a real estate guy, you can imagine, I wouldn't buy an apartment building without <laughs> 60 to 80 percent debt. That's yeah. how you make money. Yeah. So yeah. my my muscle memory is always use debt, but because I just figured there was going to be a black swan, I figured this would be difficult. You know, I I just felt it was a better way to go. To um. To just go asset heavy and very debt light, and so and also to vertically integrate, and that and so that's that's what's 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 helped uh, us because where we went from stage one to build build build. The dream is there. There will be more capital to all of a sudden, uh-oh, now there's there's not. But if you're still a big company, even some of those publics, there was still capital coming in. And then there was groups like yours, Matt, um, you know, Gotham, Navy, you know, other groups out there. And then they went heavy and, and most of them, not yours, but most of them shot their bullets. And then things got really, really tight out there. Yeah. And, and then it's all about how are these companies going to make money? Right. And, and then when you look at the MSOs, you know, we're talking about, and, and I agree, 33 different markets. Can you, um, I, I can tell you as a vertically integrated company and, and I'm, I'm sure Gavin can, can stay. It's like, look, this is really, really hard. And we're in one state. Imagine if I was in 13 States, the amount of capital, the amount of brain damage. I'm very happy that we're just in this one. Again, we passed on, Arizona, Nevada, when those opportunities came. So back to kind of being lucky that our decisions so far, the description, and, and I'll turn it over to, um, to Gavin, but the description I would use to building this company right now, it's almost like I feel like Indiana Jones for four years, running, running, <laughs> running, while behind me, everything is collapsing, and I'm just trying to keep, <laughs> keep running. Um, and, and so, uh, and I've raised money now for, since 1996 from other people. And I would say the Asian crisis before this was the hardest until now. This was a very difficult capital raise. Um, and I, I'm, it took months longer than I thought, and it, and it was hard. But uh, um, again, lucky, lucky than, better than be lucky than good. Uh, chance favors the prepared mind, Kyle. You've seen this show before. <laughs> you were prepared. Although I can tell you, and Jordan could echo this statement, not many people that are doing what you do, are doing are in the position that you are from a capital standpoint. 
uh, throughout the cap stack, owning your assets, not having public assets, having the cash flow. And for those of you who haven't been to Glasshouse Farms, go to Santa Barbara. It's unbelievable. Uh, he's got people on the ground there that are just equally as amazing as Kyle. Uh, Gavin, um, I'd like to bring you in here as well. Tell us about your operation. I, I, Kyle and Gavin, both private businesses, by the way, at Arcadian. And we couldn't be happier to hear that. It's an emerging industry. We like private companies. Um, Gavin, tell us about your business. We've always, we've always loved Group of Floor. I've been tracking you guys for a lot of years. And uh, you built a heck of a business. How would you structure things? And where are you today? And how are you seeing um, uh, the COVID situation play out for you here in the, uh, in the beginning? We're losing you a little bit, Gavin. Yeah, um, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay, sorry, I'm not sure what's going on. My, uh, I've been uh, trying to figure out, can you hear me okay though? You're buzzing in and out a little bit. You're buzzing in and out a little bit. Did you forget to okay. uh, restart um, your computer this morning? Did you forget to uh, restart your computer this morning? Uh, I did forget to restart. Yes. Should I shut it down to restart now? I, I see you loud and clear. You're coming in all right, Gav. Let's hear Okay. Let's hear your thoughts on the topic. Okay. Um, yeah, well, so uh, as, as Kyle was saying earlier, I think that when I sort of took over the, the, the helm, as it were, uh, my main goal was to possibly as soon as possible. I think you're you're we're losing you a little bit. You may have to restart it. Thanks, bud. Okay, let me try that. Well, look, I can. Uh, sorry, we'll we'll get Gavin back oh, in. Yeah. We'll, um, we'll get Gavin back in. Maybe we should mute Gavin. Is anyone else going to come back? Okay, there we go. Well, hey, thanks for hanging in there with us. We're going to continue to get some words from Gavin here in a minute, but. Maybe I'll chime in for a sec, if you guys don't mind, just because I want to encourage everybody out there looking for capital that uh, it feels a little bit like these conversations are getting uh, a little bit more clear. I mean, these first couple of months, it was very much shell shock. Uh, we represent a lot of investors. Kyle's an investor. Jordan's investor. Jordan represents other investors. So, um, you know, we want to talk a little bit about what the investors are feeling like right now and how are you feeling uh, in terms of the capital flow in this environment. Uh, I can tell you that our investors have been very happy. Um, now, we're investing in growth equity, and so ours is a little bit more of a long-term play. You have a number of years before you see some of these things happen. Uh, you know, Kyle and Jordan are on the ground. Uh, they got their hands on assets. They're putting structures together, cash flows happening, deals are happening. So, um, you know, a little bit more of a sense of urgency on some of the deals I think you guys are working on. How are you feeling, and how can investors – out there uh, kind of take uh, some words of wisdom from you and how you're coping with uh, this operation at this time. And then uh, maybe put on your investor hat and think about how you might talk about this topic for people that are watching. They're out there trying to raise capital right now. Um, so uh, if you could take that conversation, I think a lot of folks are looking for some words of wisdom and I'd be happy to share some after as well. Uh, I guess I'll I'll st I'll start, um, and then uh, Kyle, you can uh, tell me where I've uh, what I've missed. Um, so, listen, I, I, you know this is an unusual period. Uh, none of us have lived. Um, people I've heard every you know people you know describe it or uh, kind of. Um, uh, compare it to, I hadn't heard Asia before, but I've heard, you know, obviously 08 and 9-11 and, you know, going back um, into the 80s and kind of um, with the sell-off, big sell-off and Black Monday. Um, I think that, um, listen, it's hard. And I think, you know, what I've been telling our guys is that, um, this is our business and, and we've chosen to, to be in the, in the investment business. Um, we never, it doesn't say in our, in our fund documents, uh, we get to stop if there's a global <laughs> pandemic or any sort of crisis. 
And so, um, so I, you know, we need to find a way to make opportunities here and you have to, you have to be smart and you have to be thoughtful, but at the end of the day, you're, you know, you're getting paid by whomever to basically navigate your way through this. And a lot of us, you know, I, I know Kyle said he's the largest investor. Um, I'm a significant investor in my vehicle, um, likewise. And I think, you know, I, we have a big stake in, in, in making this, in making this work. And so with that said, um, and I think everybody probably, you know, um, I read something a couple of days ago that the average this is completely on an off ramp, but the average, um, cycle for people now in quarantine is, is three days good and one day dark, um, is kind of, you know, people are kind of having bad days every four days, um, which is not bad, I guess, if that's, you know, if that's the pace anyway. Um, so from our perspective, listen, we are trying to use this as an opportunity, um, to find, you know, as to find opportunities to, you know, as, um, I think it was Rob Emanuel said, no, let no good crisis. So um, we're trying to find ways and partnering with our guys. We've been very patient with our borrowers. Um, we've given mm -hmm. you know, some relief to a couple of them who have struggled from a cash perspective. Um, so that's the first thing that we've done is we've said, hey, we want to step up. This is not, um, you know, this is not something that you created. This is an a unforeseen black swan event, and we're going to be your partners here. And so we've given some, uh, interest, some relief on payments for, to uh, a number of our borrowers. Um, don't advertise that too widely. I don't want other, the other guys to know, um, <laughs> but, you know, that's what, that's what, that's what we do. We are in this, we are partners with our, with our invest, with our investments. And then on the new side, uh, listen, I think it's going to be an, it's going to be an opportunity to really allocate a lot of, I think we're very, still very bullish. Nobody's more bullish on the sector than Matt. And we're right there with that. <laughs> This long term, um, we like a lot of the the things that are going on in the space right now. We like the fact that 27 or 28 of the states have deemed it essential. Maybe more. Um, but that was the last number I saw. Um, everybody with that uh, governor in Massachusetts, he really uh, has kind of hurt the industry out there. But um, and and our guys are stepping up. Like people are finding ways to to make it work. Yeah. And that's what's kind of, that's what's so interesting. So for us. We have no choice. We are charging ahead and we're going to make success out of this and we're going to find opportunities um, that arise from this type of situation. All of us here are so happy to hear a, a debt and credit provider to talk the way you're talking right now. Giving relief, Thanks. thinking of other entrepreneurs in this moment is, is not what everyone's doing. And as somebody Thanks. who runs equity for you, you are an investor of ours, I can tell everybody, there are lenders out there who actually care about your business and who aren't trying to kill you. We do. We do. And so they're available in this industry and we love to hear that. Gavin, Kyle told us a little bit about his setup, which is very unique. And in this environment, have to applaud him on um, being prepared for that. Tell us about how you guys are set up at Group of Floor and uh, some of the challenges and some of the positives you may be seeing in this moment. I think you're on mute. Jesus, I'm having all kinds of technical difficulties. I apologize. You got a great background though, man. You're in a big setup, so. <laughs> Um, well, yeah, I'm working remotely. Um, you know, when this crisis hit us, um, you know, I, I have about 105 employees um, in, 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 in a facility uh, that is doing co-packaging, uh, distribution, and a retail shop um, called East of Eden. And so when this hit us, it, it um, lucky for us, our, our, our mayor in our, in our locality, um, said, hey, I go ahead and designate yourself as a pharmacy. That was before Governor Newsom made, uh, you know, essential determinations. So we put up pharmacy in Farmacia. We're a heavily Hispanic community. Um, and so we put up those banners and immediately started doing the social distancing, immediately started um, having the masks, the gloves, uh, you know, er every 20 minutes, wipe down surfaces. I mean, just went into full triage mode. Um, for a couple of reasons, uh, but the most obvious are for customers, for, for customer confidence and uh, for employee safety. Um, we, you know, just like all of you out there, we really just didn't know what the heck this thing was that was hitting us. And so um, we 
did that focus on, on workplace safety primarily um, just as a, as a self-preservation tool, not as a business tool. After a few days of this thing unwinding and we saw the cr incredible surge that we had at the beginning of this, we realized that um, this was not just a preservation opportunity, mm -hmm. Uh, but, you know, like Rahm Emanuel's concept, like this was a crisis that could um, yeah. be made use of. And I, I yeah. really just thought about, you know, early dispensaries, when they would open up in a neighborhood, what did they do? They yeah. went over the top to build confidence. They went over the top to, you know, Steve yeah. D'Angelo out there with a broom sweeping the sidewalk, right? I mean, yeah. we went over the top to be community members. And we did the same damn thing. Um, we immediately started doing the social distancing. We augmented our opportunities or our, our, our sales channels to curbside, as well as doing uh, ramping up our delivery, which we had taken down because of the cost of it earlier. Mm -hmm. um, curbside now accounts for 45% of our sales, right? It went from two lines to nine lines. That's banging all day long. Um, and so um, the next thing that we did is we augmented. Now we're, we're doing laser um, one big, a big threshold for us is can we, will customers freak out if we take laser readings of their foreheads before they come into the shops? Right. They flip the opposite direction. They were thanking wow. us that we gave a shit enough. You're to doing that do now, something. by the way? You're, you're, we you do that every day. Yes. That's great. great. We do that with our employees. We do that with executives. We do that with customers. Mm -hmm. And what we found is it actually increases confidence. This whole thing is a confidence issue. So it, it increases the confidence in my workplace. And, you know, just like putting up spit screens or requiring uh, people to have masks, um, it, 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 it's entire ecosystem um, confidence building. And so that's how we've, we've built it. I think the speed and alacrity with which we uh, deployed curbside, um, built up our, our delivery are, is very interesting um, in that I expect the psychological dent from this pandemic event um, will be long lasting. It'd be very, you know, I think that delivery was really increasing slowly. My expectation is this, this pandemic event is just turbocharged delivery and I don't think it's going away. Um, same with our curbside, I'd be very curious. We're on a month to month license right now with yeah. curbside. I'd be curious to see what happens when this is over. Um, I, I have a hard time imagining we'll let it go because it's been, uh, people get, you know, customers get into a habit of how they purchase. The other thing that we've noticed um, is that, and this, I'm sorry, this is a little bit off topic, but I've noticed that the, what's in the basket, what people are buying is leaning more towards value products than the more expensive um, differentiated goods that we saw before. So uh, luckily the in-house brands that we have, um, Smokestacks, Littles, Firehouse, the Fire Sale, those are all value channel brands and they're going bonkers. Um, people tend to be I think that our sales baskets are maybe up 10 to 15%, but what's yeah. in the basket is a lot more value products. So that's, that's how we've used this uh, both for measuring uh, consumer reaction. And then as far as trying to raise capital, um, it's been incredibly important to uh, show photographs, you know, show folks how we're managing this because how we manage this crisis is an indicia of how we manage our business and the detail that we put into it. For example, you know, I, I, I'm uh, sorry to say, but we have had um, an employee test positive for COVID. Um, and, you know, we had with 100 employees, like we had to react. Mm -hmm. And um, it was not contracted. There was a family member that was, that was, that was contacted. And so um, it, it wasn't through our shopping, uh, their shop uh, work, but it did require us to identify with whom had that employee worked for a period of time putting people into quarantine and like just go right into triage mode um, to ensure everybody's safety. And again, it, it's not just self-preservation. It telegraphs to my workplace and to my employees that we give a damn and that we're on it. it. It telegraphs the same thing to my customers and then to the people that I'm, I'm, you know, trying to raise capital from um, uh, it, it shows that we're on our game and paying attention to this thing. Cause we don't know how long it's going to last and somebody has That's to be right. a leader. Yeah, that's right, Gavin. We're, we're, we're in a unique position here in the cannabis industry to not be an industry that consumers have put a lot of brand uh, uh, legitimacy on. Brands have really not fully been developed yet. I think you could argue that outside maybe GW Pharma and a couple of others, nobody's really won anything on the brand side. And everybody here 
is kind of thinking about this moment and what are consumers, what are their behavior patterns? What are, are they changing? Are they developing? What direction are they going? And by doing things the right way and getting brands in front of that, uh, this is an opportunity to create customers for lifetimes. And, and, and it's a really interesting pattern we're watching unfold. Kyle, at your facilities, uh, I want to get into some more finance related uh, questions here, but real quickly on the consumer side, as Gavin brought it up, what are you guys seeing in terms of basket sizes? I know we've seen a lot of larger baskets than normal. We've seen some differentiation in the baskets that you'd normally see in certain demographics. Um, what have you guys been able to see at Glasshouse in your environment um, that may help us get a little bit better idea of what's happening and what's to come? So um, appreciate that, Matt. You know, in jumping in on um, what Gavin said, we saw a lot of the same thing and we pivoted like he did where uh, we figured people were going to move to delivery. We always thought we would do, you know, we were doing some delivery, but we figured some people would get into a new, a new habit and not come back. Mm. And so we've, during the whole COVID time, we've bought six, six, we've added six new or six used Priuses, six more used Priuses to our, uh, our four dispensaries. And, you know, one of the stores we voluntarily did curbside because it's only 1200 square feet. So we've tried to be very, you know, our, our biggest deal is taking care of our customer, whether it's through our, what we grow or whether it's um, when they come to the store and also our team members. So all stakeholders, we wanted to make sure that we knew we cared about them, even if it, if it cost us a margin. And, uh, and so, so that's, that's really worked out uh, for us. Um, the biggest thing I think, and, 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 and Matt, you know, when it comes to Glasshouse Group, our big thing is scale, quality scale at as cheap a cogs as we can get. So we're, we're constantly trying at our, at our greenhouses to make ourselves um, obsolete and, and, um, and attack that way. And so that, that's what we've done, but our, our main focus has been safety at the farms and then at the retail, get people that, get, get them to the last mile. And, and, but I also wanted to, wanted to uh, comment um, about, as an investor, if I'm sitting here today going, I have no money and I want to get into the space or I have some money, how do I invest in the space? I think you have to find ways to create value in California because I want to say 75% of the cities and counties are still illegal that if you go out and you find that next location and you do your own lobbying, yeah. you know, you may, you may be able to get somebody to help stake you. So you get that sweat equity and get that next dispensary, get that next small grove, do something that's needed in the industry. And then, you know, it's nice to have partners, you know, um, you know, that will, you know, if you, if you choose to go the debt route that they'll listen to you because I know as an investor, I, I would feel a lot more comfortable uh, with Jordan. Um, if he's, if I've put money with Jordan, if he's working, be, working with the folks that he's lent money to, because the last thing you want to do as a lender is own that asset and take it over. If you can, if you can at least just work with that person and, and help them succeed, you succeed. So I think that's a really astute um, uh, way for him to handle his investments. And it gives me confidence. And for anybody that's listening, that's the kind of person, if you're going to take debt on, you want to do it with somebody who has a pragmatic approach. Because we're not out of the woods yet. Yeah. But I will tell you that there's still a massive capital dislocation, which, uh, which is where Jordan's playing, because there's not a lot of ac good access to capital. And Matt, same thing you know, you as an investor, but the fundamentals of the industry here in California are mm -hmm. still phenomenal. phenomenal. The industry is growing and more and more people are using it and we're an essential business. So I don't think, while you can certainly say there's an illicit market and you can point out the negatives, the legal market has never been better than it is right now. Yeah. And so, yeah. you know, it's just, you know, if, if you're going to operate, be a good operator, Think about operating a, a profitable business and take take good care of your stakeholders. That that's been our that's been our focus. Well said, Kyle. Couldn't couldn't be more encouraged by those words. And, and we said the same thing. I mean, you you have to look at this as an amazing opportunity, and there's shifting things happening. And uh, thank you for giving us a little bit of an insight into what you guys have done there. It's quite remarkable. In fact, 
you have some products like Jellyfish and some others that are really unique that are coming to market. You have some wonderful operators and gosh, we just love what you guys are doing in the space. Let's shift over a little bit to the investor side. So let's talk about that. Kyle transition to it. Um, let's talk about how do you play the industry right now? I think, you know, two main ways to do almost anything at macro level, you can come in as equity or you can come in as credit and debt. I think Jordan and I can both represent those perspectives here. Uh, maybe we'll use a little uh, live case scenario with Gavin and Kyle and see if we can, um, if we can have a, a, a case study that makes sense. From the equity side, uh, you know, what are we looking for? We're looking for uh, cash flow businesses. As someone said a little bit ago, it's no longer about just the future. That was great for Canada and it was a public market that bets on the future and didn't have a lot of rules around what that meant. Uh, Kyle, I applaud you for not going public. Now, there's no reason to not go if you think you have the support, but when you don't have as much institutional support, by definition, you're still an emerging industry. And I think in most cases, you should be private and growing with what private capital you're allowed to have. We see that picking up as an equity investor. We're getting more calls than ever from overseas family offices and high net worth individuals in this country that are saying we have to shift. It's a big shift happening now. And we've got to look at some different ways to put capital to work. One of the things you do is you lean into your traditional big companies that may be a good buy. Maybe you buy a little more Microsoft, maybe a little more Apple, but a lot of your you know, core portfolio is unstable. So you're gonna lean into your alternative class and you're gonna to try to find something there that you can generate outsized returns, make up some yield. And so I think on the equity side, we're seeing a lot of new conversations from very wealthy groups that are thinking about this as a nice place to maybe be over the next couple of years. Uh, for a lot of the reasons Kyle mentioned. So I think we're encouraged uh, to put capital to work. We're looking for growth equity. We really want growth equity. Uh, and there's a lot that goes behind that. Nowadays, you're wanting your own corporate governance. You're wanting independent board seats uh, and, and board advisors. You're, you're going to want forensic accounting. You're going to want on-site field examination reports. So be prepared for all these things if you're going to get equity. It's no longer just the wild, wild west. Maybe it is. But from the investor sense, those people are largely being weeded out. So you're gonna to have to think about more structural related things, even on the equity side. And uh, this conversation is not specifically about that because we have two large cash flow businesses here that are probably more interested in talking about debt and credit. So Jordan, why don't you take over here? I'd like to know some of the things you're looking for right now. If you could talk to Gal and Gavin and Kyle as if this was your first call with them and, and tell everybody, hey, these are the five to 10 things I ask everybody that are the most important for us in terms of being able to understand how I'm going to underwrite credit and debt. I know how your mind works. It's phenomenal. Um, give us some of the things you're looking for, and then maybe Gavin and Kyle can play with that, and we can give everybody a real-life example as to how they can look for credit and debt in this market. Yep, yep. So, um, so from our side, um, the... So, so is that there's just so there's really not many lenders, and so it's given us the opportunity to be pretty choosy, to pretty be pretty picky, um, and so um, our natural, as I mentioned earlier, we're we're asset based guys. We like real estate and equipment and 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 hard assets. So for us, um, that's really where the conversation begins. Is we'll typically ask somebody to send us a list of their fi fixed assets. Um, we also want to understand whether there's any other debt in the, in the capital stack. Um, because if there is, we need to understand that and figure out how we're going to play with the other, um, with the other lender. If there is one, our preference obviously is not to have one. Um, then we'll also ask for both historical financials and, um, to get a sense of, you know, to make sure that the company can actually afford the interest payments and the principal payments when they start. Typically, what we'll do in our deals is, um, depending upon where the company's at in its life cycle, but we'll typically give, um, and it will have an interest only period where the company, we want them to kind of get off at a strong foot. Um, so six, maybe 12 months of interest only. And then we will typically like to see some form of amortization. Generally, there's more amortization on equipment because it has a more limited life than real estate, which has a longer life. But we can usually have some sort of blend that makes sense, or we can have two separate instruments. Um, 
we always look to, to meet the management team. That's obviously very, very key. Um, there are, um, you know, this, this industry certainly a couple of years ago, I think had a shortage. I think over the last couple of years, you've seen a lot of talented uh, managers come into this industry. And so that's very key for us is, is the quality of the management team, the experience, um, Kyle's point, how much money they have uh, sunk, you know, invested, how much time they have invested in this business. We like alignment of interest. It's kind of a cliche, but it's, it's really important. Um, and then we, we want to understand, then we'll do all the regulatory background. I mean, what's interesting is we're dealing with regulated companies. You guys all know how difficult it is to get licenses. And so we take a fair amount of comfort. We do our own background checks and we do our own regular. Um, we do take some significant coverage, uh, uh, comfort in the fact that there is um, the, you know, the, the regulatory scrutiny that is, uh, is applied. And then finally, bank accounts. So we should send, spend a minute talking about bank accounts because bank accounts in this industry, as everybody knows, are really, really uh, quirky and difficult to, to find. We work with a number of banks that, that will bank the industry. And we typically will require our guys to be with one of those banks. Um, it usually, it's much easier. Um, they also, the bank also understands what we would want in, uh, from a security agreement. Um, in, you know, we do take, we do try to take a, um, uh, have an agreement called a, a deposit account control agreement with the bank. Um, so in the event of default that we'd have access to the cash, and it's really the only way to get your hands on, on cash in the event of a default. So those are the steps um, to kind of start to finish. I mean, usually we can give people a sense of whether we're interested within two weeks, um, but, you know, uh, and we can get something done outside of this environment. Uh, we always do do a site visit, obviously, so that's going to be difficult now, but um, we've done deals in six weeks. Generally it takes more. I like to say that we're usually not the reason that things get delayed. It's usually the borrower that doesn't have information, they're waiting on something from their accountants, their auditors. It's usually more the borrower than the lender, but you know, think six to eight weeks kind of start to start to finish. Gavin, jump in on that. Is that what you hear a lot? Is that friendlier than most? How would you respond to some of that and um, give an operator's perspective? I think you're on mute, Gav. That, that's exactly what I hear. Um, it, it has been, and I'm a little bit of a different situation than Kyle in that um, a, the emphasis uh, of the company where I've been has been a lot more about um, restructuring than growth. And so Matthew, I'm going to be focusing, uh, most of my conversations have been with the debt guys than it has been the equity guys. Um, you know, when the whole capital markets collapsed, I mean, equity just went and it sort of <laughs> evaporated, uh, leaving really just debt. And, and, and being a, a, you know, an old bankruptcy restructure guy, I'm very familiar with the priority stacking and how creditors think about, uh, secured creditors think about the, the debt stack and, and, and priority waterfall. So my task was to go and kind of restructure everything as best that I could. Um, and and it's, it's challenging um, for those of, those of us in the industry that really kind of didn't start our businesses with a degree of uh, financial acumen and, and uh, structure that, that you see in traditional businesses, right? So just sort of evolved into this and now you've got um, all these weird things that, that, that you have to clean up. And so that's been the main focus. Um, for guys like Jordan, I've been really focusing on um, driving budgets in all of my business units so that I cur curtail you know, unnecessary spending. Um, uh, or, thankfully, the state and the feds have allowed for some treatment on tax management that gives us a lot more um, leeway with managing cash right. flow. Right. Um, I hope to see some more of that with, with the, uh, with the, from the governor's office. Um, and then uh, probably the biggest thing is adjusting that debt stack. In my particular situation, I have a lot of, of uh, creditors that I need to adjust those debts so that it can create an attractive environment for um, 
credit, credit investors like Jordan uh, to come in. In, in. in many of our instances in our industry, we we're growing so fast in so many different directions that when the money stopped uh, and you looked around, it was like, my God, I have to let go of a lot of assets. I've got to decide which ones to keep. Um, and so there's a lot of that and it takes a lot of time. It's hard, you know, it's kind of it takes 10 miles to turn a freighter around, you know? And so it, it, it's a little, you can have a little more speed when you have just one shot. Um, but most of us in the industry um, aren't that. Most of us have, you know, uh, traditionally it was 15 silent partners. Yeah. <laughs> now it's narrowed down. Uh, but there's still some legacy stuff. And so guys like Jordan do not want to see a bunch of that legacy stuff. So my job has been um, in large part cleaning that up and getting this company into a lendable place. Well, it's interesting and gr gr glad to hear that. I think that's right. Going in as prepared as you can be for when you get in front of capital. One of the questions I was going to talk about is how do you get in front of capital? But let's assume you do. Uh, one of the things Jordan just told us is nine times out of 10, probably the information isn't even there. Mm -hmm. Kyle, correct me if I'm wrong and you haven't had to take in capital yet, but I assume you will. Um, you're a, a seasoned real estate professional, so you've certainly dealt with a lot of lenders. Why would you not have everything in the data room going into a conversation with an investor, A, and then B, uh, what are your, some of your thoughts on debt and credit moving forward? So if you don't have it all in the data room, you are probably not as sophisticated in, in um, working with the debt and the equity markets because you have to give everything to Jordan so that he can see, he can slice it up to see what makes sense for him. Um, I will tell you, because we've got a, a very inexpensive supply chain and it's, and it's of scale, some of the bigger names that have run into trouble have come to us and we've gotten in their data room to see, is there some way that we could work together? Maybe we acquire them, maybe we do something. And um, it's messy. It's, it's really messy. And um, so I would tell you what Gavin is having to do is something that's, that's kind of the quarter we're in in the ball game right now. It's it's cleaning it's cleaning that up, and so um, and it's and it's important for the industry. It's almost like the brush fire that needs to happen. I think, um, and and I think investors are realistic, especially if they want to double down. They're going to ask for liquidation preferences, things like that. But I, I would tell you, I just I don't feel like we're in the clear. I had a lot of opportunities to take on debt on on, on a lot of my assets. And, and I just felt like, um, you know, I, I didn't think it was in the best interest to do that. I'd rather take some more dilution. And mm -hmm. so we set up a, a convertible bond, which gave some security and we left it unpriced with a cap and, and no floor. Um, but it was basically a mandatory convert. So if you're coming in, you're almost for sure going into equity. And, and I did that and we didn't go as high as we could have just because again, I really think we've been very lucky in positioning ourselves um, so that we we will survive and thrive. And, and I will tell you as an investor, I always worry more about my return of capital than I re worry about return on capital. Because if you don't get to step one, you're not getting to step two. And so we really have just done basics. And I think if you look at the history of steel in this country, the history of oil in this country, when you have a new industry, it gets really bumpy. And from, from my studies of history and my undergraduate degree is in history, I, I found that um, those that really were able to scale and keep their cogs down surv survived. And then later when the industry really took off, they were able to thrive. And so that's, that's where I've, um, that's been our, our strategy. In the future, taking on debt and equity, I'm sure we will. But let's let's face it. What I'm used to getting in real estate, where I'm getting three percent, you know, th three hundred basis points above yeah. prime, yeah. that's probably not. I mean, there's no way Jordan can offer that because his cost of capital is going to be higher. Yeah. And so that said, we are banking with a national, federally, uh, I mean, a publicly traded bank right now, and I have a relationship with them from real estate. So I am um, hoping that. They will then do since they've they've jumped into the cannabis area, that they will allow us to take reasonable debt with reasonable terms uh, that I'm used to, and I'm not saying anybody is doing unreasonable now, but I'm saying more of a normal business term. And when that happens, I will avail myself to that capital. But until then, I, I'm I'm pretty good. Just you know, by the fourth quarter, we should be very EBITDA positive, which 
should give us enough cash to go take advantage of opportunities. Lastly, you know, we're, we're looking at maybe gobbling up, you know, when I say gobble up, partnering with yeah. some dispensaries. And I might look to do some sort of a, almost a bond or, or something with someone like you or Jordan to say, what can we set up as sort of a facility for a specific um, asset? But again, that, that's a sort of speculative as to, as to how that might go. Yeah, thank you for that, Kyle. That's interesting. Um, we, uh, we, we think a lot of the same uh, ways in which you guys do. Thank you for sharing all of your opinions. I um, want to spend the last five minutes talking a little bit about the investor side. Uh, a lot of folks out here are looking how to uh, address the problems that, they're, uh, in fr that are in front of them right now. Capital is one that helps solve a lot of those. Uh, I can, from my perspective, tell everybody that we are encouraged by the industry. These are tough times. These are sensitive times. But the industry is alive. It's doing extremely well. You see things like stimulus packages uh, being directly uh, influenced in terms of consumer spending in cannabis. Uh, it's a necessity for people. Uh, you hear all the hard work all the entrepreneurs and investors and financiers of this space are doing right now. Um, but there are places where it's harder and there are entrepreneurs where they're not as tested and ready for this. Um, fortunately for us, we had asset values recorrect over the last year. It didn't just start the other day. So going into the pandemic, we were in a pretty strong place fundamentally. A lot of the work Gavin's been doing isn't just happening today. That restructuring's been going on. And uh, I think you're going to see on the other side of this, the industry become more attractive. As of today, on the public side, we're less than 2% institutional support across all cannabis companies' cap tables. So you really shouldn't be there. The, the, the answer to all of this is people like Jordan going out and getting larger private equity firms, larger institutional capital to be convinced that they can get into this space. Uh, and the best way for them to do that is from a real asset underwriting standpoint. So you're going to see credit and debt coming in. Get your data rooms ready. Get your information ready. You just heard from... Uh, Kyle and Gavin about what they're working on. Don't make it hard for your lenders. Don't make it hard for your investors. Have everything prepared ahead of time. If, if Jordan sees nine out of 10 deals that they aren't prepared, I mean, it's hard enough to get Jordan to look at the deal. Make sure it's right. Make sure it's right for me and make sure it's right for my investors at, at, at Arcadian. So be prepared going in. I promise you it's coming. Okay, the industry, you're in a very good place. You got a lot of demand. You got a lot of consumer behavior pattern changes. You don't have institutional capital today and we've gotten this big, it's coming. Um, so we're all working on your behalf. Um, I'll, I'll have my parting thoughts and then I'd like to pass the baton to Gavin, Kyle, Jordan to each share some thoughts and then Susan, we'll, we'll have you wrap up our uh, panel here today. But you know, my thoughts are that, uh, gosh, you couldn't be more excited about what the future holds. You really can't. Um, I know this is tough today and it feels tough. But in the grand scheme of things, the stars just might be aligning for you. And if you're out there and you're watching this, be a part of this community, collaborate, collaborate because together we're way too strong, way too strong together. You can see we're all in this together. That's why we're doing these virtual conferences. And the good news is it's taking people's lives from one place and making it better. Okay, so the work is worth it. Um, keep doing your work. If you're a company, an entrepreneur, looking for capital, looking for advice, there are, we are out there. Go to our LinkedIn's, reach out to us, go to our websites, but please be prepared. Know who we are. When you reach out to us, know what we're looking for. Be prepared to give that to us right away because in times like these, you have to be efficient, okay? So bottom line is we work for you as an investor. I want to invest in every company out there if we could, but the reality is we can only invest in so many. Jordan can invest in so many. Kyle can only manage so many. Gavin's restructuring as many as he can handle. Okay, we wanna be involved with everybody. Make it easy on us, A, we wanna do, we, we, we all believe in doing this together, but I need to be able to turn around as a manager and I'm making the case for you. I do nothing but represent companies as an investor. Jordan, same thing. We are in the middle of great operators and great strategies and the capital that it takes to get there. So every little thing you do makes our job easier as a collective to go make sure those resources you need are coming. And I promise you, the conversations are getting better at that level and they're only going to continue to get better and keep focused. Please reach out to us. We will be here for you. Uh, there are good things to come. 
Uh, Jordan, why don't we pass to you, and then let's wrap with Kyle and Gavin. Thank you, guys. Yeah, I'll keep it brief. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Matt. Um, listen, I, I, we finance um, in our – we have another vertical where we finance other companies and other industries. And the one thing that we feel uh, we've noticed about the cannabis industry for the last couple of years that is that the people in it are more passionate about the sector than any other we've ever seen. Um, and that's because, you know, people come in many, listen, there's people who just come into it for the money, but most people come into it because of the cause and, and, and they're trying to do, you know, more um, than just make a buck. And so um, I think it's important that the industry doesn't lose that. Things like this, I think, um, really help. Um, and I, and I really, um, you know, welcome these type of, of group, group conversations. I think they're really good for the industry. And so we agree. We're, 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 we're bullish long-term. We think there's lots of opportunities. Uh, if you kind of look back, um, there's really been no other industry that has had one hot, one hand, maybe two hands tied behind its back like we have. And it's pretty amazing. And still it does, it's still fighting, you know, what is it like a one-legged, what's it, one-legged man, one-legged man in a shit Never given up. Contest, yeah. <laughs> so don't give up. Let's keep moving ahead. Anything we can do, I'm happy, Susan, I'm sure we'll give our information out. I'm happy to talk to anybody who's looking for debt. If we can't help you, we can at least give you a sense of maybe other people to talk to or what you're going to need to pull together. And um, we are also a, a cheerleader for the industry. So we, we, we agree with Matt. Thank you, Jordan. Thanks. Hey, Kyle. So, so Matt, yeah. Um, so final thoughts. Um, I, the industry has never been in a better place. And I know it's really easy to get negative. But as a former advocate myself, but still jump in, but, you know, an advocate, less people are getting arrested. That's massive. We're starting to let people out, expunge records, massive. And there is a place for the folks that have been doing this for a long time. There's a place for the small player. There are in all industries. So it's hard on everybody. You heard Gavin is, is you know, up to his neck in restructure. This is not easy for us, even without debt. It's, it, this is a, a tough industry, but we are gonna come out the other side. The capital dislocation will end and there's good times ahead just run your business like you would any other business and you will be rewarded. And, and, and when it comes to us, we, you know, if you own a dispensary, cause right now we're in acquisitions mode, if you own a dispensary, we're, we're largely in stock, but we, you know, we ask anybody who would want to roll in with us to come visit our assets, come visit us, meet us. And all you have to do is reach out to Susan. Susan knows me personally. It's been to my home, been to my, my house, you know, my, my office. And we're close so she can fill you in but if if you're an operator out there and you, you think you're doing something great and you'd like to be part of a of a fun organization um then we would certainly welcome the conversation glass house is as good as it gets my friend you guys have done a first class job and looking forward to seeing what Thanks, you guys Matt. continue to do and uh that's the name of the game you know a lot of consolidation but it's really just partnering up it's so big we can do it together uh better than alone uh, Gavin, uh, floor is yours, my friend. I think you're on mute again. <laughs> Some, it keeps going to automatic mute. Um, so, you know, Matthew, I mean, they're I, trying I, to tell you something, Gavin. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> subtle, super subtle. Um, I, uh, I really appreciate your positivity. Um, you know, Mike. I was only able to get my company to EBITDA positive this month um, by not being so rosy about it. I really came at it from a perspective of there is no Calvary coming. The politics are not changing. Uh, fix your ship. Nobody's coming. And frankly, that's how this industry started. You know, we would just go it alone. And that's really, uh, I kind of came to that perspective in February, probably like there is no money coming. You have to do this yourself. You have to be crafty. You have to be creative. You got to take off the gloves and get into that fist fight. And um, that's what we've done. And we're continuing to do it. I mean, it's it, it, like you pointed out, it's an ongoing process. But that's how you get to that, that, that capital um, stability position now. And so that you can focus on things like growth, right? And I talk about nominal growth in 2020. Um, you know, I think that probably the key to everything, if you sat back and really thought about how we're going to fix this industry, 
in my estimation, is one thing. We need more dispensaries and we need more dispensaries now because we need to have access to the people. We need to get, that's a way that you get customers to start buying. We're dying from the, the black market because there's not enough access points. I'll tell you that in my estimation, law enforcement's approach to the illegal market is gonna be no more effective in the future than it was in the past. It's gotta be creative economic levers. And uh, I'm not waiting for that to happen like Kyle and trying to go for dispensary shops. Um, but I think that uh, I'm not intimidated by a lot of shops opening up. I'd like to see that. All that will do then is focus the business to another area. I think to the earlier point, that's when brands start to come alive. When there's actually something going on on the dispensary side. I look at my co-packing operation and distribution and sometimes I go, shit, all of this for less than 900 dispensaries? <laughs> doesn't make any sense. Yeah. So, I, I, you know, my positive side of this is it's still really early in this industry's evolution. And uh, get through this phase and the rest is cakewalk for until the next, you know, situation. So that's, that's my, my last bit. Thank you, Gavin. We'll do it together. We'll do it all together for everyone watching. Please reach out to us. God bless you all. Thank you, Susan. Thank you so much, Matthew. Thank you, panelists. I, uh, we have so much more to talk about. So let's keep this conversation going. Maybe we do this again next month, first Thursdays. Keep it open in your calendar. Um,